Yeah, let me disable my stream. This Click on the Twitch. To... Okay. Restream perfectly fine. Is now going to my recording to YouTube. Everything is fine. Great. We are live. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm here with just one monitor today because one of them died. It was giving me electric shocks, overloading my graphics card. So you'll be seeing absolutely everything on my screen today. But um, hopefully you're okay with that. So today we got Marty, Nefarious, Nerding Freak, Primon, and Zach. Hello. How's everyone? So um. Uh, so today we got a couple of cool questions. Um, Slink is not here yet. He asked a question about what do I think about using the Blender game engine like Armory up BGE. And Zach here has asked a very cool question today. And also Navaris has asked another question in context of the shark, which I just had here. Rick, I was just showcasing before this. Is like what happens if I mix the emotions? For example, I make them joyful like this and joyful with a little bit of anger. It kind of makes a new type of expression. So, um, the controls has a middle mark. So usually, when you mix emotions, you can't go on the middle mark before things break. So let's go to like this um, happy sad. So there he is. He's kind of like a more of a dopey sad. Obviously, you need to fix some teeth. They float too much. Well, that's what happens when you mix the emotion. For example, this power emotion with peace. So let's uh, throw in some power closed. And then throw in some peace. That looks constipated. But... Yeah. Maybe the power is a bit too much of a strong emotion. Or maybe a crazy surprise. What? This one won't mix very well with anything. More like an expression. Or you can mix and match, like just, for example, if I go back to my power pose, I use like the letter L in. I can start, depends on some of things. As you can see, this is at 1%. So some of these animations, they can't mix too well. But maybe this joy one is the best one to mix too. So here he is, and now I can make him talk. Without too much problem. Because it's a pretty neutral pose. So there we go. So that's the mixed animation. So let's get back on track. It's good to be ADHD, you know, right? So you can really control what emotions you want to give him. Yeah, to a degree. And on top of that, because this is an animation clip data, when I have a pose, I can uh, control every aspect of the rig without any problem. So I can change and tune and fix up the mouth move, whatever I want on the character. Uh, so that they're just guidelines, right? So they're not stuck. I can control it to however I want it to be. That's the cool thing with the rig. You can even like make his teeth grow bigger or smaller, right? So there you go. That's the power of this rig. The emotions are just guidelines, but you can animate them separately, change them, modify them, whatever, to however you need. Okay. Uh, cool. Okay, so uh, Brian, oh, you're new here. Welcome. So welcome to the Q&A. Um, today we're doing a, a answering your question, Zach. So Zach, tell me, um, I'm going to read your question. How do you go about building a unique style in digital 3D? As in when starting a project, be it animation, game level, art, series, etc. How do you settle on a visual style that you will know will stay consistent throughout the project and not technically limit you to down the line. So Zach, um, can I know the context of your question? Why are you asking this question? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm doing some uh, environment art uh, 
um, projects recently and building stuff in Blender and Substance Painter and moving it into Unreal eventually. And um, one of the things I struggle with is, uh, especially with um, like forms as well as, well as textures, is building a building a consistent style which will um, stay you know fairly similar throughout the world. So it's a it looks like a unified world in terms of shape and form language. But um, whenever I try and go into a sort of more unique sort of art style, it tends to have technical limitations. Like it's uh, extremely difficult to export or you end up with horrible meshes or um, that it looks fantastic for trees, but for rocks, it's, um, you know, it gets, it completely breaks or um, it's very difficult to match a character with the style of world that you've put in place. So I don't, I don't know, there's a, a whole, uh, <laughs> Um, what's it called? Like thought process behind it. And I was wondering how you, because especially if you're exporting stuff, like you have to settle on a style, just form language style, to be able to eventually start exporting stuff and building stuff. Um, and I was wondering how you settle on that without worrying about whether it was going to break the more stuff you do. All right. So concerning stylization. The way that I work it. So let me give you some of the context. There was this one last project that I done. It was uh, an NPR project, which I showed a tiny bit of last week. It is still under NDA, so I can't really show a lot of it. Basically, I had to design trees, rocks, or different things. So if we go into my pictures folder and look at my mind maps, um, this is my process. For example, when I want to make a world, first things first, I make my mood boards. So a mood board is my collection of references. This is what you do as well, right? You have a collection of all your references that you use. Yeah. yeah. Here they are. And then from these references, this is what I build my ideas from. Bring up the ref. So you got your mood boards right, you've got the first step right, you've got your references right. So the next step is, okay, you start to study. Start to study the concept. So if I go into my mind maps, load them up, do pure F, this file here. So full screen. Right, so here we go. So this is what I do is I kind of categorize what I need, and then I start to find the consistencies in references. So first things first is I have like this mini tree bush, like a little cloud, they're everywhere. And then I have, I take a look at like, how is the leaf cluster design that they're doing? What is the consistent designs they work with? And then I have a look at like different plants or trees that people have made, which is a little more, more spiky on a central uh, trunk with bigger leaves that spread out, do this analysis. I create that type of tree. Um, on top of that, I go through color, shape. So I have a whole bunch of different things. So let me just bring up the full flower uh, mind map that I had with just the trees and the bushes here. So. It's no longer it's no longer a mood board and it becomes a mind map. Right? So I'm just doing a mind map. This isn't the concept art, this is just a study, basically. So I have a concept of like, okay, so what is the patch of flowers which is in the shadow, which is the patch of flowers which is in light, which is the patch of flowers which is cool and spread out everywhere. What are the ferns design looking like from references? What are the grass consistency lines that created? Uh, what is the, the shapes of the grass and how is the grass um, designed? And uh, the games that we had as a reference, um, how, how are the tree shapes uh, thought out and created? And then from there, like, what is their particular design? So this, this tree trunk that I found from Luisa R. Tanaka on ArtStation, she had a really interesting concept of creating forks. 
with a curve. So you have a straight line and a curve. Straight line and a curve. So I took this concept and I made this rule. One, two, three, straight line, then curve, four. Right? Uh, same with like the sticks. If you have a stick, it sticks out. If it's big, it's chopped up, and then it goes out, and then like two, three, four. Zigzag, always zigzag. Don't keep them straight. So when I do the branches, you have the one, two, three, four, hook. One, two, three, four. Look. Same with the roots. You have one, two, three, four, like a zigzag, like lightning bolts. One, two, three, four. All the trunks are twisted. So these were like aesthetic design choices that we did for the trees, and they turned out great. Um, quickly show you a picture. Basically, it's it turned out like this. So we've got. We made like a design of the flowers and the grass and the plants and things. And on top of that, we also made a consistency with the, with color. So if we go into my mood board, I also did a color study. So look at my mind map, go to my color study, throw that up. In my color study, I started taking a look at like client references and figuring out um, the, the problems that I had, which was too yellow, right? So we started muting the colors and getting like the lights and the darks and the blends, and the browns, getting the color palette just right. The color palette is very important, especially with you working on MPR or design or things. So you do the study. This is what I call a mind map. Um, I don't think it's industry standard, but it's basically what you do before you start making concept art is you find the design consistencies in your references. Um, you find the shape language that that's uh, very typical in it. So for example, here you have this bush that is kind of spread out and long. Here you have this bush which is round and like a little cauliflower. You have these sticks which are designed in a very particular way. You have these spiky shapes. And you start getting your shape language and the general language. And then you make some decisions. So for example, we had this big tree which we were basing off oak and eucalyptus, which is kind of like when it's small, it's a little triangle, then it pushes out and becomes a bit more squarish, and then all of a sudden you have this big square looking tree. Nice and tall. So in the references, or in the final product, we had some really big, as you can see, the big trees are kind of squarish and spaced out, but the smaller trees are more like a rounded triangle, and the tiny little trees are little triangles. And that's what we worked with pretty much and it turned out great I mean I was very happy with the product I did it quite a lot then with the rocks you start thinking of like we take a look at the rock references um, go back to my mood boards and take a look at my rock references here I'll load it up to pure if give me a moment these are pretty big files so what I did is I did some location um, research and the rock that I decided to use was very typical of Naze of alpine areas and the rock is called Naze which is a sedimentary stone very dense and formulative so it when it erodes by ice and water it can turn into kind of this broken up layered thick layered um, looking rock that also has this blob blobular feel to it which is typical of alpine areas and um, mountains and rocky ranges and things like that, which was very similar to the game references that we were looking at. So from there, we started looking at other people's work. This was some rocks that I created as some shape language. And then from there, I started working on uh, the basics concepts of the, the shape of the rocks. So let me just bring that up for you by date. Let's see if I can get these images in. There we go. One, two. Oops, where is it? There we go. So I got one, two, three, four. So as part of the of the creative process, this is where I started getting into 3D. And this is where you take a look at the shape language of my rocks. 
So I was going for something round, something square, something triangular. So with these round, square, and triangular shapes, it got me kind of a concept of, okay, so I have something triangular like these shapes, something square like um, these shapes, and I have something round like these shapes. So I, I took those common language um, language forms. We did an analysis like, okay, so the hierarchy, how's the hierarchy of the, of the design? You know, the, the Fibonacci sequence and things like that. What is the angular concept that we have? And from there we started, I started making some basic shapes with silhouette first, keeping that in mind. So that I can then, uh, I sent it to my coworker. He, he sculpted in the details and did the baking of the edges and things like that. So that we could make some, some boulders. And there we go, we got some boulders. It scaled quite big actually, but they still managed to survive. But the shape language is consistent and part of the world, things like that. That's what we did. So. Oh. Hello. Uh, hello. Mike was muted, so. Yeah. It's all right. So how do you go about building a unique style in 3D? Well, it becomes, um, let's do it practically, yeah? Just to give you another example of that process. So here, I've already done some work on the style and I started creating some rules. My first rule is that the canvas of the animation needs to be on paper with normals and canvas edges and corners, external light, so that I can get a useful comic book layout with for montages, but have a canvas and a timeline with blocked animation through the canvas. This means I can also light the canvas for storytelling with color around the render in real time meaning that it's like you're looking at a painted surface that's what I wanted to do the paint must have depth which means broader based brush strokes more focus means more detail in the brush strokes so that means I need focus on the paint I need paint splotches that must contain either water or oil based color unevenness on dry and paint splatter cracks and then even dry paint can help and paint normal so now I start looking at my uh, character consistency. So all of this is like by looking at these images. This is the mind map where I start looking at, okay, so the characters has the most detail. The background doesn't have a lot of detail. Um, there's a lot of like focus on certain areas, different types of textures and things like that. So um, that character. I think I moved the user on. But it gives me like an idea of like, okay, so what I want to do, how did they do it? Why did they do it? Why does it look the way it does? Um, well, I look at other references as well, for example, from other artists. Um, what is important? Um, what is their color palette? You know, they have a lot of muted yet saturated colors. They're like very dark. Blacks are blacks. And there's never actually a full white, or it's very rare that white becomes white concept. Mixed mediums and things like that. So I started look, taking a look at the, the style, and then I start creating some rules. So in the characters, characters must be defined and use pencil line art beneath the paint, and the colors must bleed. Fine strokes and weighted line art. Characters has a lot of color bleed from their hair more than the face and the color between the characters bleed a lot so for example if he has a red shirt the red will bleed onto his pants uh, the shadow color can be characteristic of the character so for example here I have a character who has red shadows and this character has dark red shadows but the world has black shadows so if I look at this character as well the character has red shadows this character has red and green shadows based on the world or black. So, or but um, this character, or some other characters, like this Green Lantern looking character, or sorry, yeah, Arrow guy, his shadows are more of a his own green uh, tinge to it. Meanwhile, this Batman is more of a blue tinge to him. So, like their own characters has their own shadow color based on who they are on top of the world. 
So that's something I need to keep in mind with a rule. Highlights are painted in with white paint as a common thing. Uh, lights, highlight and rim lights are painted in with colored paint, either orange, red, or white. Paint splotches must contain watercolor unevenness on dry and paint splatter following contours. Cracks and uneven dry paint. Characters can have colored pencil pen shadow hatching based on angle, which is what is similar to this vibe that I showed last week of painting and the, um, the pencil. So I kind of have some rule book, a rule book. So now I can start applying it to an actual character. So I got uh, some rules um, based on like the environment, some rules based on the characters, some rules based on uh, my studies, things like that. For example, there's a lot of paint splatter and observation of watercolor in the paper. There's darkness around certain areas of the paint by weight, variable thickness of the dried ink. It's kind of splotchy. So that's something I need to keep in mind when I do it. So let's go to my characters. Let's work it out. So as you can see, the creative process is kind of like when you settle on a visual style, it's kind of like you put... You feed your brain the correct references that you need and want by location, photos, other artists, other games, anything you need. And then you start digging up all the consistencies, start defining a rule book, a design rule book. Once you have your design rule book clear, then you can start thinking about the specific rules for making things consistent. So there's one thing I need to keep in mind is robots. Um, so, some of the rules here for these robots is that nothing is sharp, is always a rounded corner, generally, around the robot or the machine. Um, the pieces are, has a very clear language, but fill them with lots of little tiny details, almost like a texture. Um, there's a lot of paneling or like encased robots, so there's not a lot of exposed armor or joints. Kind of like a Japanese Gundam of some kind. And the line art is very defined on the actual machine. So if I mix in the two techniques, the closest one I have here is like... Let's see if I can put it here in the architecture. There we go. It's like on this car. So the lines on the contours, the shape of the paint, the way it's filled in. There's a very clear body of the shape with very small details and texture on the details compartmentalizing the general shape of the encased hull. So that's the kind of language I need to keep in mind. That's a rule. That's a rule that I've got to keep in my head. So the rule is... Overall shapes enclosed, lots of little tiny detail and general compartmentalization, but mostly through textures of the general shape form. So let's go to the robot that I need to make today. Go to my characters. His name is M447, and I've already started looking at his rules. Um, I first take a look at like, okay, so what is his purpose? First things first, he's a comic relief character. I've talked about this a couple of weeks back. And then I start doing some studies of the references that I found, looking at the shape language that they use. So I've done this before already with another talk. And the robot that inspires me the most is this CRTV, or CRT uh, monitor as a face. I really like. I think it's very human. He's a friendly character. And then I start looking at the details and the shape language. Um, is and look at the common consistency. So since this character is comic relief, he's not very grounded, he's very aloof. So in comparison to like a robot like this, who's very grounded, um, I gotta think of like, it, the language of his feet shows that this robot is not moving anywhere. It's mobile, but it's stuck to the ground. Meanwhile, something with um, smaller feet, for example, would show that he's very nimble, likes to move around a lot. Um, and likes to do his job. So the robots that has encased armor is kind of like this guy here, which I really like. You can see the detail between the joints from, I think this is Matrix. 
and um but he's got a lot of armored pieces or like this boxy character these boxy russian kind of looking machines which looks kind of interesting but the problem is their head is not very personal but i need to think of the purpose the purpose of my design is always about the story so he ha works with his own power he's very mobile he like he can take a beating for touring that means he's a very robust robot but he looks cool he's stylish he's he's got he's garage he's got colors he's designed for a club lights he's retro and refitted many times so he's kind of a a frankenstein he's the opposite of uncanny so that means he's uh he's not human looking but he does have human interfacing that means he's friendly emotional expressive that's why i use the tv um he's got uh he can change his shape to some degree based on the function that he needs to provide. He's like a one-man band system, which it means musical, instrumental, uh, interface, sound, and lights. He's a sarcastic and cool comic relief character, and he's a multi-purpose kind of a drone. The original design was this. Um, so the consistency from a client is that um, we got to think of the language of the general series. In this case, since he's a comic relief, I could say he has small feet. Since he's very robust, I'll make him with very wide shoulders, similar to the original design. And his head, um, I'll probably uh, work him out a bit more. Since he's like a multi-purpose robot that carries a lot of stuff, I'll probably make him quite stocky as well, the way he carries all the equipment. But keeping him relatively nimble. So that's what I need to keep in mind. And if I go back to my style sheet, um, the general design of the characters, um, we're looking at very tall proportions, um, very long characters, very broad shoulders, very long legs and arms. Their bodies are very stocky. Their heads are very, uh, very long and defined shapes. Generally, it's kind of like a straight line, straight line, straight, very angular lines and modeling some kind with very uh, defined normals I guess you could say to bring out this shape so the shape language that I like the most in the contrast here is the lanky joker and a very stocky Batman so with that in mind let's start working on that so first things first where do we begin we start with shape language so let's go into our sculpting layout. Let's go into the default area. And let's start just playing around here. Yeah? And we'll get some rules up. Let me just full screen for a moment. Bring in a grease pencil. But is it clear? Do you understand the process more or less before I start working? Or is it uh, still a little bit, do I need to clarify one of the steps will make it a bit more formulaic? Where is his writing? Oh, it's, it's, it's much better. I was just wondering, what, um, of those, all those mood boards, what, what are the uh, select purposes um, for each one? Sorry, you were just uh, skipping between them. I couldn't see which, um, which mood boards were for what. Okay, so I have them separated by characters. I have a generic character design, a drone character design, the Soka, which is one of the characters. He's a girl, alien. And we have Ohm, which is the key character. He's a guy, DJ, based on the clan. And then we have my style board. My style is like the general, this is the motherboard, the one that defines everyone else. And then in my other scene, I have style boards for the environment based on the different areas of the animation. Let me just load that up. Also, thanks to you could hang out, Nefarious. I'm glad you liked it. Right, so let's go back. So in the environment, I have it separated into hopefully a minimal amount of areas. For example, in the streets, 
downtown center and I also started organizing my mood boards so like which one has more influence to me which one has medium influence to me and which one has the least amount of influence the least amount of influence is kind of like what I don't want almost so my high influence ones are the ones that I really like the language that it uses and the way that it works the ones the medium like yeah these are acceptable but the ones that I don't want are these types of ones so it's kind of like I'm trying to filter my mood boards based on those concepts and also just getting if I need more information on different areas this is what I work with so that's where I start working you know um, one thing I notice with my ship location is that there are bridges there are big structures that are really tall there is some imbalance in the world you know like whole bunch of pieces that looks like it's going to fall over at any moment canyons towers of of stuff overbearing weight that feels like it will collapse at any moment cables straight lines cables that show where you're supposed to go and this image here really speaks to me because we see the robot person thing with the character kind of like what i'm doing so one is from Russia, this one's from the United States in the 30s or later, and other ones are like actual pieces of art or concept art from other people, just to give me some idea of where to begin. So these are the new awards, they're all separated by categories, right? The locations of where I'm going to set the cameras, where I'm going to run around with the character, where I'm going to be, and which part of the story. It always boils down back to the story so this is kind of like a map right the club there's a lot of things going on in the club there's a lot of like uh, walking through the streets there's a lot of, there's the junkyard where he discovers the robot and he discovers a spaceship and repairs it and then there's the industrial area where is the um, where the junkyard exists so it's kind of like he kind of hits a uh, rock bottom in the industrial area of the city as he moves out from the city center from the club and these are the streets of like where he's walking through to those points which is um what i kind of map out in the story map out in the game level map out in the animation so that's why i divide it into groups because you can't eat an elephant in one day so i chop it up into pieces and then work on them in pieces make sense yeah thank you cool all right, so let's start working here, and I might just bring out a grease pencil. And one here. Basically, start thinking about shapes and form. So the things that I needed to keep in mind was what? Just draw to vertex paint color, a blackish. Get a bit wider. Okay. Full screen. So the rules, number one. His shoulders. Right? He needs to carry. Right? That's the rule that we need. Two. He needs to be nimble. That means he needs uh, very strong legs, small feet. Right, cool. So this is so he can move around. Three, we need him to be expressive. So that means we need the the TV head, pretty much. Right, cool. So four needs to be um, versatile. So with his versatileness, that means he needs kind of like a backpack, I guess you could he carries something or something on his arms that he can put out number five top of that shoulders so that he can carry weight right. uh, next thing that we need he's versatile and this one as well he is repaired repaired and robust so because he's repaired and robust, that means the shape language needs to be boxy. Boxy and modular. 
And the other rules from the style that we had was that we have big, um, big shape, nice and clear, big. Then you have uh, small, medium, medium shapes. You always work in threes, right? And then you have tiny, small shapes. So it always starts with like the big boxy shape. So those are my six rules that I'm going to work with based on my analysis that I've done previously. And let's work it. So now I start um, doing my concept art or like first off my stencils. So I'm going to move my weight to the brush size. Probably a bit bigger. Go nice. Um, maybe a bit more. Okay, cool. So it's drawing on the surface. So my first things first is that I want his TV, right? It comes down, and then we have like big shoulder pack. Then we got. Let's just try to see if it works with like really long arms, and really long legs. See if that works for me. Relatively small head. Kind of machine. That's the first one. I bit of style, maybe a And then I start experimenting, right? So that I didn't like. Let's try again. Try different design, nimble feet. You bring his arms up and then down because he's ready to move. I start trying to design the, the general concept of the character based on that idea that I have in my head of the rules that I have. Right, go to another one. So uh, he's very. Maybe I need like another human as a human for scale. So what I would do is import a character, start drawing him to scale compared to the character, or just draw like with another color. My character human is going to be uh, yay big. The reference of what I'm going to use. And so forth, right? So, um, questions. Do you guys have uh, anything to add into this process? Um, well, as usual, your explanation is just quite nice. You left nothing to add, but I would suggest for Zach that you shouldn't focus a lot on having like nailing the style or making a game for yourself like i don't know what type of games are you intend to make but uh how to say this usually when i make something i would go with the style that it's more comfortable for me at the beginning just because i know i can do the style easily without having to do lots of calculation, lots of uh, thinking and learning. But yeah, you're, so you're definitely right. Um, this, yeah, it's a, it's a portfolio piece because um, I'm still at university, so it's a portfolio piece for when I apply for internships. Yeah, coming up. So, um, <laughs> so it's it's this. Yeah, I haven't got many um, projects, like major projects, that have a a set style, which is why I'm. Um, if it's yeah. a portfolio piece, I would suggest like nail the something that you know the style that you know the most, 
because you're basically in a portfolio, you're showing them what you can do. So the style that you know the most, you should start with that. And start experimenting with other styles. Like for example, I suck at drawing. So I started to learn how to do NPR renders and NPR modeling, just because mm -hmm. this is my like how to complement my weakness with my strong with my strong uh, aspect. So I know how to 3D model, but I don't know how to draw. So I decided I will use 3D modeling as an app a tool for drawing and yeah. <laughs> also don't be hard on yourself if you don't do as good as other people because for example uh, i don't know if we can talk about him but gabe for example he's a math genius like i don't know <laughs> how the hell he does this stuff but every time i see his stuff part of me is proud of him and wants to make something as good as him, but part of me knows I'm never gonna be as good as him. But that doesn't mean that you can't inspire from him. For example, uh, I'm making a commission right now of for like a friend that wants like a um, uh, what's called the Grand Canyon in, in America. Can you remember what's the name? But he wants it in NPR style, so. I sat down like for two days studying rocks, studying canyons, and then remember that Dreas made a video where it was a stream about uh, sphere shock and generating rocks. So I started also studying that and found out like uh, what's called procedural generation is also will help me make the, the, the commission easier for myself and also learn something new. So, first of all, as to recap, just focus on what you know, add some, uh, like, fix your weaknesses with your best assets. So, see what you're good at and try to complement your weakness with what you're good at. I don't know if this makes any sense, but I'm sorry. Can I like, yeah. uh, I suck at explaining. But it's good. That's actually you're quite good. Like if you're comparing yourself oh, to helps. others, oh, yeah. you're you're gonna you're gonna waste your time if you compare yourself. But you can take take what's good from others and yourself. But basically, you gotta also tell yourself like style is style is basically just consistency. Consistency. Yeah. If you stick to some rules, then you are consistent. If you have some rules and you stick to them with everything you create, you've created a style. That's basically yeah. it. It's just, um, so for example, um, here I'm right now, I'm taking a look at like um, the consistency with the, this particular style. I've noticed that their bodies are really long. So when I start working on these characters, I got to think in my mind, like for example, this character here where his body is very short right this is not consistent this is breaking the rule this is breaking the style but this character here who has a very long body and these ones here have very long or like coats or things that make them look like they have long bodies is consistent so this character here who has a medium shaped body would not be right so yeah. you style is basically that um not if you want to create style, just think about consistency. Follow the rules. Good. Yeah. And also, like, uh, how to say this? When you start, don't focus on, okay, studying colors and studying like a combination that works well, also good, but don't make it like the most important thing. Like, for me, because I'm colorblind, I usually go with grayscale, and most of the time, good because it gives you uh, how to say this the the shapes and the silhouettes and the theme. I don't know if you are making characters or just uh, environment because I focus on environment. So for me, silhouettes and 
scale really important facts because I'm not gonna make like a human being and and put it in the scene next to a tree and the tree is smaller than the person or example mountain is the same as big as a horse okay so also giving this elements of scale and silhouettes will also help you a lot like understanding the how everything works like the silhouette in the screen oh my god my english that was good you're doing great uh, thank you uh, i'm sorry i like i've been awake for like 18 hours now oh, man. looking at some math nodes <laughs> anyway so yeah like don't worry a lot about making your own style because no one has his own style exactly i mean yeah don't I, worry about that uh, <laughs> i can remember curtis uh, said in one of his videos that no one is creative like i'm not saying no one is creative but creativity comes from mixing lots of styles together, whatever you see in the world and whatever you experience in your life, you can create your own style based on that. Because like we as humans are kind of like hive mind. So whatever one experience comes experience for another person later on. Like, like now, basically what I learned, what Rias learned, you're basically taking it and now deciding what to do now on with it. So mixing up stuff and saying no, I'm copying this one, no, I'm copying the style, it's not bad. Okay, just copying is the first step on developing your own sense of artistic way. Because later on you will know that okay, I don't like this color scheme, but maybe this color scheme will don't like the, the dimensions of this character, like the head is too big for me, or the, the the torso might be a little bit slimmer, and then you will start developing your own style. So, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, here I just discovered a rule that I found. It's like these people usually has one measure of head, three measures of body, or four measures of body, and like five or six measures of legs. So if that is going to be a rule that I'm going to work with, then I would say, okay, the characters need to be one or six, for example. If I want it super exaggerated legs, very small head, or something a bit more balanced, one, three, and then five, for example. Still keep the legs nice and long and the measures so that they're nine heads tall instead of 11 heads tall. Typical human is only, what, seven heads tall? So, and this is where I start creating like some rules. Um, same with the proportions, you know. Um, the proportions, uh, if this is going to be my rule of one, three, five, so my big shapes are going to be five times bigger than the small shapes. And my medium shapes are going to be three times bigger than my small shapes. So, um, when I say, for example, if this, that, if this is going to be like my design proportion rule, um, this is going to be what I'm going to work with my style, my consistency. Then if I have this shape as my small detail, my medium shape is going to be like this. And then my big shape is going to be five times this, which is going to be like this. Right? That is my hierarchy of detail, pretty much. One, three, five. And so everything I design, including like a chair, let's, let's think of a chair or a couch. So I'm going to have a shape of a couch, a nice big shape like this. This is the general shape of the couch. So now I start focusing on three details. So my three details are going to be like this. That's going to be one third of the big shape or one fifth, sorry. These are the sizes of the edges of the couch. And the little details is going to be the legs like this. So this is going to be my style because the shape is, this is five, this three, three, and three is one, my one measure. And from that, I can start focusing on the little details, right? 
the cushions, the, the textures, the, the shapes of the of the couch, and how I'm going to shade it, and, and all the other things like that. But my general shape language of my design, because I have a rule. Okay, so now I need a table. How am I going to design a table like this? So I create like a. I'll do it from another angle over here. So I have my general shape of the table, which is going to be this oval, and then I'm going to use just the base, which is going to be this, a third third of the shape. Then it's going to have a couple of details on the ground to hold the table. And maybe like in the center is going to have a hole where it connects with the base down here with the shapes like that. Just a rough idea of how I want to make a table. How thick would I make the table? You know, it's going to be my five shape, my three shape, and then my three shape, and then my one shape. So you have those rules in your mind that when you create your elements, so that you have a general. Uh, it's a de it's a design choice, but you always keep. Um, if you want a style, then you just focus on rules consistency and then you work those rules and consistency if the rules are too limiting and break them down into something that gives you freedom hierarchy numbers sequence and then work it that way so for example here um, they did the same thing with the spider verse is like okay character needs to be clear sharp and focused Everything else behind the character that's not in focus needs to be either fully textured, distorted by the um, depth of field, or got this comic book feel. So characters always need to be in focus. Car um, the background needs to either be a flat, solid color, or blurred out of focus so that it becomes a bit more complementary to the design style. And you keep that, that's a rule that they had. So they made sure that everything that they created in the backgrounds and their design of the, their sets and the environments to make sure that the characters would always have a very strong silhouette. And that's the important thing, right? Their rule is the character needs to be nice and sharp. So you can start designing, like for example, this, this furniture set. So let's make a grandfather clock. So we have the general shape of the grandfather the clock, which is a nice big shape. My rule as well is that things are tapered at the top. They're always bigger at the top and smaller at the bottom. So, grandfather clock, nice and big at the top. My three shape is going to be this, uh, the round thing and maybe the box thing side, but with a shape. And then the little details are going to be like my one shapes. So there's a tiny little uh, rotating clock and this is my general shape of the design. Grandfather clock with maybe a little foot thing here, and foot thing. Here. Maybe I start like maybe another three thing at the top here to kind of get this general idea of what I want based on the concept. So I have like a I start designing that with basic numbers, okay? the bare bones, the rule. I need to make sure it's one three five. I need to make sure it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. I need to make sure that there's a curve of about uh, 15, 20 degrees. Okay, so 15, 20 degrees, 15 degrees, 15 degrees, 15 degrees. 15 degrees. Um, if this is too straight, because of my rule, then this would be curved even more. Kind of fit that, and this would be a bit more tapered out to give me a little bit more... Um, of my consistent design choice that I have for this particular piece. Yeah. So that's what it is. Um, style is just consistency, pretty much. Nothing else. Nice and simple. But this is probably not going to be my style because so this is where I need to think about it. Like here, I have some crazy art deco type of vibes. But here I have something a lot more, a mixture of chaos, which is curved lines mixed with straight lines. And then we have this crazy looking interesting curves and sharp lines. So 
that's a really big inspiration for me is is art deco i love art deco especially the concept of film noir as well that came shortly after but art deco was uh, from a period of the 1930s based off egyptian concepts but they their idea is very concept of this curve line straight line corner curve line straight line corner but then we have this i have this whole crooked vibe in my head everything is a chaotic mess of rafters and pieces of art i want it to be a very i want the animation to show the psychedelic conflict and unrest that the artist has inside the character in the world i want the world to feel like it's a dystopic chaos everything kind of fits together but it's chaos and uh, this idea of the psychedelic curve lines and straight lines this rule these rules that i that i start to see that these are angles here's an angle here's a curve here's another angle here's another curve um the curves are huge but the angles are small so everything that is angular with right angles are tiny but the big lines are very long and curved same with here here's a big uh, curve here's another curve but the curves always end at a corner this is where the art deco comes in so i've got to think of like okay so if there is a curve here there's going to be a corner here um, same with this one here um, the way that with the people use the lenses here's the curve of the building corner curve of the sign corner so in the concept of where i draw things like i have this curve here and then a corner i have uh, Look, here's a curve here on purpose and then some corners um same with the okay so i gotta think okay so how chaotic do i want it to be so if there's chaos we look at these lines and they're straight but then we have some curves that kind of brings out the general shape of this building so i gotta think of these right angles inside in the detail but my general shape is always going to be a curve so that's going to be my uh, my rule that I'm going to use. Same with like here. We here we have a curve in the side of the building, but then we have these right angles, all of the in the little tiny details. Same with like the textures. The textures are straight, and that's a really interesting idea to me. But in the overall shape, it's a curve. So that's the consistency that I see the most in these pieces of art. Um, so that's what I need to like envision inside of my design of the world and also the same with my characters. So now that I know that this design style is the way it works, I can go back to my references of the characters and I can start to see that this character has sharp corners to define detail, but the biggest shapes is this curve of the cape and he is very sharp he's a curve of the head but the curves always end at a point right here same with the arrow guy here we have a general curve but it ends at a point there it ends at a point and we have the general curve then there's a corner here we have another general curve but at some point there's always a corner so that's the design style that i need to work on with my characters and I need to think, okay, so that's the rule. Big, long curves that always end at a point that always has a curve, uh, a corner, sorry, so that I can work it. For example, this character here with the Hulk, if I was working this as a curve, it would be more like um, this would be more angular. Curve, corner, and then, and then get into the other curve. Corner, and then get into another curve. Corner. And my details would be uh, more in that kind of uh, concept that I want in my head where I start drawing in the shapes of the corners and start stylizing that concept instead of using everything with uh, that concept. But in the texture detail, I can use just corner, like very sharp, uh, quick, straight lines inside the shapes to bring out the shading of this particular character and the style rules or the consistency that i want right so i hope that's useful
A style is consistency. <laughs> And JC is called out because he loves isolating his subject on his poetos. There's there some more comments here. All right, so I'm going to tie it up today since it's been nearly an hour, but we're going to, uh, now that your hair is slink, you wanted to ask me about the Blender game engine like Armory or Up BGE. So before we go, would you like to clarify your context? Why do you ask this question? Uh, yes, Current, I'm just currently learning Amory for Blender, and, and it's really fun, yeah. Cool. And I haven't tried Amory a lot in UpBGE. I used to use the old game engine a couple of times, and I've talked to the developers once. They gave me some temporal anti-aliasing in the viewport for volumetrics as a patch. So I use that. Kind of nice. Well, my opinion is uh, if you have fun with it, why not? If you want a job, I recommend you probably learn something more common like Unity or Unreal Engine. But if you're an independent developer, whatever works, works. That's my opinion. What do you guys think? You guys should use Blender based game engines? Okay. Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> just, okay. It's not bad. <laughs> not bad. Okay. Like, if you want to experiment, go ahead. Just because it's not really, the, like, the development on the game engines is not as big as other game engines, like Godot, uh, Unity, Unreal, um, what else? You shouldn't invest lots of your time unless it's a hobby. Like you want to to focus more on more use uh, engines, and because of two reasons: one, they are always their like their community is bigger, so the chance of you finding someone to help you with this stuff is good. Like it's really big. The other thing is gain more experience, and this experience can be useful later for work, want to work in game development. Uh, don't be cynical like me. Like I hate Unity. I refuse <laughs> to work with Unity. Yeah, and it's a strong bias, this, right? Yeah, this is making me go. Uh, like I find it harder to find jobs because. I am more of an Unreal Engine person, so try not to be biased like me. Like right now, I'm, I'm regretting not working with Unity, and I kind of like started to learn Unity again, just because I want the job. <laughs> but also, I'm not saying like open source uh, game engines are trash. I'm saying like not all of them are good. Uh, also, if you want to experiment with new tools, there is also the core engine from uh, Epic Games. It's it's nice to work with, nice to play with. Their own like like their own programming language though. It's uh, like uh, C sharp or C plus plus. If I remember right. So yeah, experiment experimenting is good, but as long as you give it the time of experimentation. Don't dedicate lots of time to it unless you're intending to really, really work this engine for the future or looking to develop uh, yeah. tools for this engine. So as long as you're not going to dive inside of the engine and you're just going to surf on it and just develop games just to develop games, use more common uh, engine again. Unity, Unreal, Godot. Uh, what else? Yeah. I think that's excellent cool. advice, yeah. Because I, I think it depends on the context as well, right? Like, yeah. as you mentioned, if you want to make games just for making games, then just to use something that's more supported for making games, 
in something that's a lot more niche. But if you want to like develop the tools for the niche tool to make the niche game or that niche project that you want to do, yes, using a tool would be perfect. For example, if your game needs a grease pencil and you need it to be interactive with the grease pencil in a 3D space, then it would be awesome to use the UpBGE because you have grease pencil inside of it. So you got to like... But if you like, want to make something that has 2D physics with a really cool uh, system for drawing the, uh, the physics, then maybe it's best to use Unity. Like, depends on the context. Or if you need like a really super detailed AAA cinematics produced very easily with um, some awesome foil scattering that's built in with post-processing, then maybe go with Unreal Engine. The context also kind of drives if it's good or not or not it's a uh, gonna be a waste of your time oh. yeah i agree there okay okay so think what type of work are you gonna do on that engine because what type of uh, how to say this are you more focused on uh, environment art or light uh, lighting shaders uh, coding because for example as an environment artist I focus more on a, an engine that gives me tools to make my life easier not harder so I go for a great engine because you know uh, it has uh, the landscape the tools uh, the whole procedural clouds and lighting light thing uh, so this is why I'm five but if you're more of a coder, I can also recommend that you try to buy a Pi game for Python. It will help you also develop a sense of how engines work. And it might help you with the, 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 the how it's called, the Armory, the Armory engine, because it's based on Python. So you can also finesse it. Uh, yeah, you cut out there just at the end, so I missed the last, last thing you said. Yeah, uh, as I, uh, I said, like, so it depends also what type of work you want to do inside of the engine. Yeah, all depends on basic. That's right. Cool. Thanks for that tip and thanks for the advice. I think it's I think it's an excellent answer. Really good. At, um, hope that that answers your question, Slink. But it is now time for me to start closing the session. So thanks everyone. Thanks Nefarious Joey. Oh cool, you showed up. JC O'Brien, Nerding Freak, Prime on Slink, Marty who was here earlier, and Zach, and um, everyone else who was here. Thanks for thanks for hanging out today in attention and hopefully it's kind of summary of uh, creativity and also understanding what is a context to judge which is a good engine or not or if it's worth your time or not was useful i will see you guys next week same time same place and i will finish the stream yeah so, thanks again guys thanks okay thanks yeah. see you later <laughs>